Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. India and Australia on Thursday elevated their ties to a comprehensive strategic partnership, signed over seven key agreements, including a landmark pact for reciprocal access to military bases and another on rare earth minerals during an online summit between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Australian counterpart, Scott Morrison. Against the backdrop of their frosty relations with China, the two countries also unveiled a shared vision for maritime cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, a region which has been witnessing growing Chinese military assertiveness, triggering concerns among major players. There has been strain in ties between Australia and China as well after Canberra pitched for an international probe into the origin of the coronavirus. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the first ever India-Australia virtual bilateral summit. Joining me on the program today are Navdeep Singh Suri, former ambassador, Patrick uh, Gerard Buchan, director, Center for Strategic and International Studies, and uh, Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha, retired defense expert. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador, I'd like to begin the program with you. Let's first try and analyze and understand the key takeaways from the first ever virtual bilateral summit between India and Australia. Well, I think uh, one important takeaway is the fact that it happened, the fact that we didn't allow uh, the coronavirus or the bushfires in Australia or other reasons to postpone, which is what would have happened in the previous years. So I think it really shows a commitment by, by both countries at the highest levels to have that relationship on track. Uh, beyond that, you know, when you look at the uh, slew of announcements that came out, I look at it from two different uh, sort of dimensions. There's the bilateral dimension and then there's the regional dimension, which you could call the Indo-Pacific or the Quad or the various multilateral arrangements that have been discussed. Uh, and between those regional and the bilateral, you see tiny bridges connecting them. And most of those bridges, if you look closely, have China written on them. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, when, when you look at uh, uh, some of the things that are ostensibly bilateral, uh, whether it is critical and strategic minerals, whether it is the super funds, whether it is uh, uh, the cooperation that we've spoken about in maritime domain awareness, etc. Um, there is a subtext to that, and it's important for us to look at that sub subtext. I mean, I would go a step further and say that, you know, having served in uh, Australia for a while, um, we always used to lament that this is a relationship with great potential. But we would bask in the glow of that potential without actually realizing it. And I think finally we are beginning to realize it. The level of ambition uh, uh, displayed by Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Scott Morrison is much higher uh, than we've seen on previous occasions. Uh, and, and while some of it has to do clearly with the uh, commitment of the two sides to realize that potential, but I think if there is a, an extra element of urgency. The catalyst uh, is China, which has infused a, a degree of urgency uh, and a degree of energy into uh, the, the relationship. Absolutely. Admiral, let me bring you into the picture now. You know, there have been some significant defense developments as well, especially in the maritime domain. If you could take us through that. Uh, Frank, you uh, laid down a very good canvas and the ambassador has uh, mentioned very important issue. Uh, what you see is that there is a convergence between the two countries as far as the maritime domain is concerned, uh, particularly the Indo-Pacific, the Pacific part of it. And both have a vision document. And now a joint document has been signed, which we will see what happens later on. Uh, you know, that was a little bit of a blank area for the for the India's maritime domain awareness uh, because it was halfway down the world. Uh, so now the you know, agreement to share the maritime domain awareness, that's the first very important part because you got to know who is where if you want to do something. And also it says that, you know, the maritime agencies will increase their uh, uh, interaction. We already have an uh, hosting mechanism, but now that is likely to increase into trilaterals uh, in the areas or in the countries where Australia is already having a bilateral arrangement. For example, Australia, Japan, Australia, Indonesia, all this, particularly Indonesia. If that trilateral and Australia, Japan, India becomes a trilateral, then you see a, a congregation of these countries, which is minus the U.S. So, uh, you know, if you are looking at possibly, as, we, as they say, that, you know, it's becoming a multipolar world. So, possibly you have to think about a 
you know, the middle power, the mid middle power congregation, uh, where these democracies are going to be together and taking care of this particular area, uh, because the U.S. is slowly there is going to be a, a withdrawal symptom. You are looking a lot depends on the election which is coming up. But if I read the, the you know the, the Senate committee, they have been questioning about you know navies. Uh, what assets should be you know, procured and what should be our expenditure. So, you know, in all in all, I think that we are heading in a very good direction. If you remember 2008, we, uh, Australia was not very keen to join the squad at that time. But now there has been a very active sort of uh, uh, initiative on part of Australia to come into the war. Absolutely. So, Patrick, you know, considering the aggressive stand that China has taken, especially in the South China Sea and in the Indo-Pacific, uh, more so, you know, after uh, the lockdowns and after seeing the onset of the pandemic as such, would you say that this was bound to happen, really? Well, uh, bound to happen is in a bilateral meeting between Prime Minister Morrison and uh, Prime Minister Modi. Um, I, I'd say uh, it obviously had to happen in, in terms of a virtual summit. Um, I think that just as a, I guess, as an historical point, fascinating to see we're now seeing grand summits between heads of government conducted uh, via technology, much like you and I are doing this interview now. Uh, I wonder if that's going to be a, a sign for the future. Um, obviously, the Australia-India relationship, as the ambassador correctly pointed out, and indeed the Admiral alluded to as well, um, is a relationship destined um, to happen. Um, for historical reasons, the relationship has uh, has has been warm, but now it's extremely uh, ex extremely hot, if you will, in a very good way. Um, we're seeing, as the ambassador alluded to, uh, a slew of uh, bilateral agreements reached. Most particularly for me, uh, the mutual logistics sharing arrangement. We're now seeing basing access, uh, access between the two militaries and supply chains. Um, obviously, I wouldn't also downplay, uh, the Admiral spoke very uh, very eloquently about the quad. I wouldn't downplay the fact that we do have, across the four countries now, centre-right parties in office in all four capitals. Um, that, you know, politics does stop at the shoreline, but it does help that there is a common world view between, you know, those liberal democracies of the centre-right. Um, so we are seeing, uh, you know, this common alignment, but also obviously China's, we, we face a different China than we did in 2008. Uh, and there is a common realisation that through the Quad and also through the enhanced bilateral relations between the countries concerned, uh, we're seeing this common world view between the four great liberal democracies of the Indo-Pacific region. Absolutely. All right, taking the discussion forward now, Ambassador. What has pushed Australia away from China? Because, you know, as far as the Quad is concerned, or several of these other multilateral, you know, organizations are concerned, it was Australia which was, you know, trying to keep away because it was close to China or trying to, try, or trying to you know, play the neutral cards, if you, if you could say that. What, is, what has been the turning point? What has changed now? But, you know, I, I, I'd say that's not entirely correct because mm -hmm. uh, there was a point of time that... Uh, uh, we were willing to join and uh, during Kevin Rudd's period and Australia uh, pulled back. But thereafter, for several years, Australia has been uh, uh, pushing us and uh, we've been a little bit uh, reluctant because of our perhaps uh, concerns or about China's sensibilities. Uh, maybe these were exaggerated concerns. Uh, maybe it's time to set those concerns aside and move ahead with areas where we think are our priorities. Uh, but the fact is that in in, in uh, September on the sidelines of the UNGA last year, for the first time ever, the Quad met at the ministerial level. And I think that is a very powerful signal. Uh, and and, and the, there's a reiteration to that commitment to continue with discussions. There's a second aspect about the Quad which is important, and that is that beyond the mutual logistics support agreement between India and Australia, we already have one with China and we have one which is ready with Japan uh, to be signed, which means that all four of the Quad members would then have these agreements in place to share their facilities with each other and to work on the interoperability of uh, their uh, uh, platforms and systems. And, and that is important. Beyond that, at the bilateral level, 
you know, uh, when I was there uh, in Canberra, we started not only the first Australian uh, Indian maritime uh, exercises, the OS Index, uh, but we also signed that white shipping agreement for which, in fact, Admiral Dhawan had come to Canberra to sign that uh, agreement between the two countries. And that was the first step towards building that maritime domain awareness uh, uh, capacity, uh, in, in a sense. Uh, but what uh, we are, uh, uh, what we also started was the first two plus two arrangement uh, dialogue, uh, where the foreign secretary and the defense secretary of the two countries meet together. And what I was really happy to see was that that has now been elevated uh, to the ministerial level. That once in two years, the two plus two would take place at the ministerial. And the reason this is a big deal is currently we have that arrangement only with the United States and with Japan. So you can again see that that desire. Uh, to give some teeth, some muscle to the notional idea of the quad that existed until, say, a couple of years back is now unfolding before our eyes. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, Admiral, uh, let's talk about another military aspect, now something that, uh, you know, Patrick uh, referred to in his opening statement, the, you know, the pact on sharing military logistics. How is that going to help us? Because I understand we also have a similar arrangement with France and the United States as well. Uh, you know, Frank, it gives the access to our own ports, to the Australian ships and submarines and landing of aircraft. Uh, and similarly, the Indian Navy ships, submarines and aircraft uh, at the end of a mission uh, in the Pacific, where I'm sure that they will work out some joint surveillance processes because the MDA has to build up the maritime domain awareness. So it's a big thing. Uh, you know, the Indian Navy ships and Australian Navy ships can uh, actually take, uh, you know, uh, fuel from each other's tankers, supply ships. Uh, that's a big thing because, you know, it's quite a way down. The distance is quite a lot. So I think the ability to reach and ability to stay on task, that's going to get enhanced very, very significantly. Also, you know, it also improves your chances of looking at each other's procedure and equipment and how to improve the, how to increase the interoperability because both of us, just like the ambassador said, you know, we have to have similar kind of compatible equipment so that the MDA can be effectively utilized and the naval ship is if required to go to that area to ensure, you know, free and open sea, following the, you know, the uncrossed uh, rules. These are important things because idea is that, you know, they have both identified that the problems are going to be in maritime domain. And if you recall, some, some while back, our defense secretary made a statement that Indian Ocean where the action will be. And therefore, India has to look at Indian Ocean. So there is a great convergence. And you know, it has absolutely opens the limitless uh, uh, possibilities of cooperation and interoperability, which is a big thing. You know, you, uh, you can increase the length of your uh, duration of the patrols, uh, you can stay on task for longer, you can exchange, you can have a brief and debrief in Australian ports, or Australian ships can have that in Indian ports. So I think, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great, and that is why we don't have it with many countries. You know, we have at the moment only with, uh, Japan is yet to be signed, uh, uh, except for US and France. And now we got this, uh, you know, this arrangement of uh, uh, both ways uh, in, in, the, in the French uh, islands, which are in the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean, Southern Indian Ocean. Absolutely. All right. So, Patrick, you know, uh, does this mean we are going to see more such cooperation going forward from like-minded Mike, uh, from like uh, minded nations? Well, I think certainly, um, you know, as we've seen, you know, History takes a, take, takes on a, a, a life of its own. Um, you know, there's only so much that politicians and diplomats can do, but events events roll forward. So I think there's an inevitability to this. Um, you know, as I said, in 2008, we saw the Quad, uh, a, a kind of mythical notion. Um, I don't think that's the case at all. The Ambassador and, and the Admiral both alluded to the fact that it, it, it is becoming a reality now. And it's also operationalizing itself now. Uh, we, we know that there is some, some serious talk about Australia joining the Malabar naval exercise. Uh, as the Admiral would well know, Australia does not participate in the Malabar exercise, which is initially between the United States and India, and then Japan joined, I believe, in 2015. 
Um, there is certainly a lot of talk around that Australia will eventually participate in the, in the Malabar naval exercise. The, the great four democracies of the region, uh, the J Japan, the United States, India and Australia, are increasingly not only working in a minilateral way, but in a bilateral way. I, I think you're going to see this quad plus notion developing, that is countries like South Korea, uh, Indonesia ultimately ultimately joining in a in a more uh, multilateral uh, uh, comprehensive way in which the democracies of the region both the long established ones and the emerging democracies continue to work together and as we know this is about demonstrating to countries like China that seek to um, uh, do away with the established norms and the established rules that have served all of us so well and as I've emphasized before on your program Frank China has been one of the largest beneficiaries of the liberal world order for which China has been able to lift itself out of um, out of uh, out of the poverty out of poverty and lift the you know all boats have risen. So for China to continue the path that it's on is ultimately self-defeating for China's own uh, own interests. Absolutely. All right. Since we are here and since we are talking about China, Ambassador, how is Beijing going to be looking at all these developments? Um, I hope with a degree of introspection, uh, a degree of self-reflection on where have they gone wrong uh, uh, in, in getting so many countries upset uh, against their actions. Uh, because I think it, it's really important to, to understand that, uh, you know, in your previous question, you'd asked what happened with Australia. Uh, I think the level to which uh, the Chinese were trying to intrude into Australian in systems, into Australian institutions, uh, using sections of the Australian Chinese community, uh, using Chinese students in uh, Australian university campuses to uh, uh, rally support for South China Sea or against the protests in Hong Kong or other things. You know, it's almost like the Communist Party feels a sense of ownership about over each and every overseas Chinese, and that Chinese is, be, is to be seen as an asset. Uh, you know, so there are things that they have done that got the Australian um, government deeply concerned. And over the last four or five years, we saw one after another the Australians enact legislation uh, uh, in terms of the Foreign Investment Review Board, in terms of transparency in the political contributions, because you saw efforts to bribe some politicians uh, being exposed, and, and so on. Uh, and, 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 and I think all of that was a warning signal that uh, open democratic societies, open econom economic systems uh, are now up against a player that plays by a very different set of rules. Uh, and, and so unless you put in the defensive measures, you're going to be in trouble. And, and I think this is something that uh, several other countries must internalize. But I just want to move away from the, the regional and the China dimension to the neglected fact that there's also a very strong bilateral agenda in, in this uh, summit. It is not as, uh, as seductive as the defense and security side, but there is real stuff happening on energy sector cooperation, on battery storage technologies, for example, on hydro pumping uh, uh, storage uh, technologies which are emerging in Australia, um, in agriculture in terms of, uh, uh, you know, post-harvest storage uh, techniques and logistics and warehouses uh, in terms of water conservation and the water management in which the Australians are particularly good because it's a very arid continent. And, 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 and finally, uh, you know, uh, a lot of attention is being paid by both countries to the fact that we now have uh, the largest growing uh, uh, major diaspora in Australia, uh, 700,000 and, and, and counting, but how different because they come from a democracy, they come with their own opinions, they come with their own perspectives and behaves in a very different way. So there's a lot of other stuff that is going on. One area, just a final point from my side, I feel that in the last five or seven years, the Australian government has consistently advocated a closer uh, economic relationship with India. Uh, my, well before the whole recent conversations about diversification of supply chains, etc. But the Australian private sector, I think, was so seduced by the China opportunity uh, that it lagged behind uh, as far as uh, building uh, the uh, ties with India was concerned. I hope that is going to change now. I certainly hope that we will see the Australian super funds, the big giant pension funds that you have, uh, uh, take advantage of the Indian business opportunity and, and perhaps see more uh, investment because 
really, if there is one aspect of the relationship that is lagging behind, uh, that is this uh, economic dimension. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Admiral, uh, coming back to the more interesting aspects as, uh, as the ambassador was calling them, you know, I'm going to go back to a point that Patrick was making about, uh, you know, Quad and the Malabar exercises. What does this mean for Quad and uh, exercises like the Malabar series, of course, that India conducts with Japan and the U.S.? Uh, Frank, I think Patrick is just absolutely on the dot. If you if you see the joint statement, uh, it says that they have committed to strengthening the Quad system. And uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Australia is taken in for Malabar exercise sooner than later, uh, because this uh, agreement actually paves the way. And that's why I said the possibilities are umpteen possibilities. But there are two things which is important that, you know, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he had mentioned in, uh, you know, in his talk in Shangri-La last year, uh, rather 2017. 2000, yeah, yeah, 17. So he had said that centrality of ASEAN, so now you will see that very, very officially, very legally, Australia, Indonesia, and uh, India, uh, they are actually forming the three bases of the tripod uh, and Japan on top in the in, in the Indo-Pacific region. So there is ASEAN centrality is being maintained, which is which is right thing to do. The other issue which is uh, we tend to miss out is the marine environment. You know the plastics resource preservation, uh, you know, going into details of doing the seabed mining and resource exploration together uh, because, you know, the marine environment has been very badly damaged by China in the process of uh, digging out the, you know, uh, mud and making those artificial uh, islands. Well, I don't call it an island because it is not an island. So, the point is uh, that now Australia's only thing left out of all this is to come to Malabar, expand the scope and area of exercise. If you see the Malabar exercises, they have taken place either in the Indian Ocean or by and large in the South China Sea. Because we have had agreements for our ships to go and berth into their harbors and reciprocal. But now, you know, you can have these exercises for a longer period of four countries' navy between South China Sea and Australian ports. So you are covering a very large area, uh, you know, which actually goes beyond the second island chain of the of the Chinese. So I think that you know, all in all, uh, a time will come uh, when this will possibly become one of the uh, base for the architecture of security in the coming days that we are talking about a new security architecture. So U.S. will back, but these three, four, five countries with the ASEAN in the center is going to become very important. If we have to, uh, you know, implement the uncross, a time will come. If somebody is not following uncross, what do you do? So that agreement will come slowly. The process is on, but I think that this is a very good, uh, uh, what is called the, you know, the dance or concert of the democracy, like the Japanese ambassador was saying some time back uh, when he was in India, and he mentioned about Australia as well. So I think I think it's uh, all in all. Uh, this should have happened earlier, but the, these countries are seizing the opportunity of the middle power congregation that is very important. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, so all right, so Patrick, so are nations around the world looking to India, especially in the region? And I want to give you one such example, that of, you know, President Trump inviting Prime Minister Modi for the G7 summit. So clearly looks like, you know, the democracies around the world are looking to India to play a leading role, at least in the region. Oh, there's no, there's no doubt about that, Frank. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, as India and the, and the Indian national security establishment gradually increases away from its non-aligned mentality, which is completely understandable uh, post-independence that India took that position. But Again, I spoke of events take on a life of their own. And history has placed India now as a great power in the region. And by, you know, within the next 10 to 15 years, there's no question India will become the third largest economy in the world. So with 
you know, the, the classic path to great power status is economy times demography uh, equals political power on the great stage. So the world is moving towards, you know, the events that accepting India as a major, not only regional power, but global power. So the, the fact that, you know, Prime Minister Modi will be at the G7 here in the United States in September, um, hopefully we get beyond the point of, uh, of travel bans and so forth and the leaders can meet, uh, at, I believe, at Camp David just outside of Washington, D.C. So increasingly you are going to see India playing a larger role on the world stage. Hopefully uh, in time we see India joining the permanent uh, members of the Security Council. I think, you know, when foreign policy realities and global architectures and global systems do not reflect reality, that's when the system could go wrong. So countries like India, in my view, uh, as a great power, need to be sitting at the largest tables that exist. Absolutely. All right. Uh, I've got very limited time on the program, so I'm going to get a quick closing comment from you, Ambassador, on how do India and Australia build on you know, go, or go from here, from this summit, build on the summit. So I, I think uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, there's an interesting aspect that we haven't spoken about, which is also there in the fine print that the leaders will try to meet every year. Uh, there's almost an annual summit process that has been discussed. That, that is crucial. Uh, when you look at the rest of the architecture, there is the foreign ministers meetings, there are the joint commissions. So I think that institutional architecture is now in place. Uh, I would reiterate that we've done a lot of things right in the last one year on the uh, defense and security side to get closer. Please don't neglect the economic dimension because at the end of the day, that's how you build real lasting stakes in each other's uh, uh, well-being. Uh, and, and so I, I would say that we do would like to see a lot more Australian investments coming into India, a lot more technology collaborations happening. And certainly to see uh, uh, some of the pension funds establish operations, uh, particularly uh, given that they were so heavily invested in China uh, and, and, and would probably over a period of time look for alternate uh, uh, options. Absolutely. All right. On that note, then I'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that the bilateral relationship between India and Australia is in a good place. We only have to build on it going forward. We've done well over the last year and a half or two as far as, uh, you know, the military security and strategic aspects are concerned. But we should not neglect the economy as well as what the panelists are suggesting. With that, it's a wrap. See you again next time.